Welcome to the discussion today. We're fortunate to have Mike Clark. He's the division president of Hollingsworth and Bowes. Um, and Ross Ardell of the McElvain Company and I are, are interviewing him, him today. And Mike, I'd like to have you start out with, uh, give us a little of your uh, background and then what you're doing as president of high efficiency and filtration, if you would, please. Sure. Uh, my background, uh, you know, seems like yesterday, but I've been with uh, h and now for 17 years, um, and almost exclusively in uh, what we call high efficiency and special filtration, which for us is uh, products ranging from uh, above MERV-8 HVAC through uh, HEPA and ULPA to uh, room air purifiers, um, appliances such as vacuums, uh, liquid filtration, Mainly for us, that means one micron, poor size, and less. And then, uh, of course, what's ever popular today, the PPE, uh, respiratory protective equipment, mainly. And uh, we, uh, we've got a very broad array of technologies, and uh, I think that's what allows us to compete on uh, these high efficiency areas, which are increasingly going towards synthetic properties and composites. Uh, in another uh, webinar today, I was uh, likening the uh, world to, as one big clean room with, uh, and, and as you know, because you're, you're doing a lot of stuff in the clean rooms, uh, even in pharmaceutical clean rooms there, you know, em embodying this concept of you have class 10,000 clean rooms with cleaner clean rooms within it. And uh, so I, I do think it's useful to think of uh, of uh, treating COVID as uh, as one big clean room, but tell us a little bit about your about your clean room activities because that's certainly where your high, a lot of your high efficiency uh, filters would be required, right? Sure, that that's a right. Um, yeah, the, although the product lines can be used in a number of applications, the vast majority for us clean rooms, and those are uh, either semiconductor or general electronic clean rooms for LED. LED panels to uh, pharma clean rooms and uh, clean rooms used for the medical industry and food and beverage. h and is a pretty, a pretty significant player in that area, particularly with our being vertically integrated in microglass fiber. And I, I, I think you're particularly well equipped to deal with COVID because it's down, well, there's a virus and obviously in pharmaceutical clean rooms, uh, viruses are a big deal. And, uh, and then, of course, the semiconductor plants, uh, you know, you're at class one clean rooms, you're talking about, uh, you know, e even the cleanliness of a, of a class 100 pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical clean room isn't enough. And so uh, you certainly have the capability to remove whatever uh, contaminants need to be removed, do you not? We, yeah, we certainly do. And in another, in a number, rather, of, uh, of medium. And uh, I think that's what we're starting to see today is that people actually care and are willing to pay for those higher re removal levels or higher efficiencies, as we say in the filtration industry. And uh, I think it's a trend you're gonna see uh, remain in indoor air quality. There's a big surge going on right now in the market where people are making a push towards uh, in commercial filtration or even home residential filtration up to MERV 13, where maybe they were using the MERV 8 type product before. That uh, that is all in recognition of what's going on right now in COVID. Yeah, the uh, the, the theory that uh, that we're pursuing right now is that most of the COVID is um, one way or another airborne, whether it's initially airborne or whether it's already airborne by a cough, a cough droplet on an inefficient mask being. Uh, uh, converted into smaller droplets and aerosols. And so the question would be whether, you know, what MERV ratings should be the HVAC systems be? I, I know there's a shortage, for instance, of MERV 13 filter media right now. Uh, are you are you furnishing the MERV 13? Well, I know you are, because down here, we're gonna have yeah. a show, show one of your uh, graphs there. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Great, we are, uh, we're a pretty significant player in that, whether it's pleated media, uh, 
contact or uh, pocket filter media. The, the are applicable to uh, the, the, the respiratory protective equipment. So uh, you're seeing a lot of the capacity being consumed by that. And I think uh, like other companies, HMV is prioritizing the medical segments right now. Um, but as we come out of this crisis, of course, we're planning on how to be ready for this next chapter in maybe a new age of appreciation for emergency filters, and that becomes the norm. Yeah, I think that is a, a good point. And then uh, we're also, uh, we have uh, the, the coronavirus technology solutions, but we also have the coronavirus pharmaceutical solutions with the idea being, you know, how soon is there going to be a vaccine or a therapy? Or, and um, the best we can tell at this point in time, it doesn't look like there's any uh, neat solution that if there is a vaccine, it's a question of how long it will last. And uh, uh, bef- uh, so like, it, it's very possible it's going to be some, like some of the other viruses where you need a shot every year uh, in order to be p- protected. So it looks like uh, a lot of hurdles to... Uh, to cross there, but I, I wanted to get on to uh, the, the fact that you have this new new material for non-surgical medical gowns, which would be probably not in your area, but the question would be uh, with all these ne- needs for the mass, for massive upgrades of uh, the filters, uh, Sean O'Reilly of um, American Air Filter was one of the um, speakers this morning and he was saying that the demand for MERV-13 filters is up uh, 10 times from uh, what it was, and they can't get enough filter media. So I'm sure, you know, they're leaning on uh, uh, people uh, like yourselves uh, uh, for that uh, for that media. And uh, so I guess my question to you would be, uh, are you seeing some of the same media being applicable to a, me- a number of these different applications and therefore even more critical? Most definitely. And in, uh, in for us, uh, we have different variations of that. But of course, the, the media that's in most demand, which would be the highly electrostatically charged MERV-13 media. So that way it can be used uh, in a typical air handler where maybe you're you used to run a MERV-8 filter, you can meet the pressure drop. Those technologies are the technologies that are the backbone, really, of uh, the face mask and the, uh, the respirator and ventilator products. So that's really uh, the big rub. It's interesting. Uh, this big surge that we see in MERV-13, initially we thought it was because people were cutting up filters for masks because there are all kinds of reports of that in the media. And maybe there there was something to that, but uh, now it seems to be a fundamental shift in the market. And uh, certainly, there's uh, there's guidelines in California from. Well, we're we're going to uh, uh, pursue a lot of these issues you, with you, Mike. And I, th- I think you've just brought up a very interesting one, which is the electrostatic charging, and of course the fact that uh, you've got this nano wave that uh, gives you high efficiency even without the electrostatic charging, but you do have the electrostatic charging capability. T- tell us a little bit about that, if you would. Sure. We uh, we have uh, electrostatic materials in, in a number of forms. Uh, one of them is the standard uh, melt blown, and we have some proprietary uh, charging technologies that give a good durable charge that penetrate deeply into uh, into the media. And then, of course, with the chemistries of the, uh, the polypropylenes themselves, we're able to retain that charge for quite a long time. Um, you know, for example, we, we have data going back more than a decade of for uh, melt-blown materials that have been stored correctly that are still able to pass easily the, uh, the NIOSH standards 10 years later. <laughs> and uh, there's other technologies we have that are related to carding for our technostat material, for example. And that has even a higher charge, but also very durable charge stability. Same kind of thing going back more than a decade, the, the charge will last on these media. Huh, that's uh, it's interesting that it would last uh, last so long. And the the upgrading, uh, you, you're not losing a, a lot. It, it looks like uh, on some of the you know graphs and things that you put up, uh, you know, as the charge de- deteriorates over time compared to some of the other materials. That that's right. We think that's a differentiator for us. But of course, uh, if you want to discharge it, you can discharge it. And uh, certain environments lend themselves to that. And uh, 
That's why I think historically electrostatics have been so strong in the respirator market because they're, they're meant for a, a one-time use. Um, uh, your, your furnace filter, for example, that may be uh, in your home or in a commercial environment, they, they recommend them to be changed frequently because we're not sure how they're discharging. And uh, you know, that's always a big, big topic of debate uh, between the U.S. and Europe and how to, uh, how to gauge that correctly. And, and the truth is probably somewhere in the, in the middle. There's a great value to electrostatics when you can use them. Uh, but if you need absolute filtration all the time, then there's, there's mechanical techniques and there's mechanical uh, technologies that HMV has that allow you to have a uh, high efficiency with a low pressure drop. So the best of both worlds, but there's always a trade-off. So the malls are being, you know, like Como is telling New York malls, use HEPA filters if you can. There's HEPA filters yeah. being installed in a number of places. Uh, MERV 13 is being specified as kind of a minimum with recommendations that uh, MERV 16 uh, if, if in fact, um, most of your, uh, COVID is, uh, transmitted through small aerosols, then, uh, the MERV 16 or better probably is, uh, is what should be pretty universally used. And if that's the case, what, what would H and V be recommending to, to, to have a reliable MERV 16, uh, rating? It, uh, of course, it's going to be constrained by what, what the footprint is and what the, uh, the form factor of the filter can be. Uh, certainly, we, uh, we really like the nanowave technology for uh, its baseline mechanical filtration. Of course, it can be boosted with an electrostatic charge to make it even higher. That, uh, that's our favorite solution, but of course, uh, we have uh, the historical mechanical means like glass filter media or even pleatable synthetics type media that can also do that. The, uh, the filtration technology is there. I think the bigger challenge is on the design of the broader HVAC system. So as great as it is to have a HEPA filter in a mall, of course, depending on the number of air changes you get, um, that aerosol may be sitting in the air for hours uh, before it's passed finally through that, that nice HEPA filter or it could be 10 minutes, which would of course be much more effective. So that's something that uh, the broader industry needs to come together on and designing the right solutions. And you, you mentioned putting it into the HVAC system and we're looking you know, at, at, at graphs here that show the, the pressure loss. And uh, so you have some advantages in lower pressure loss for a given efficiency. Uh, with the, with the nano web, do you do you not? We certainly do. And uh, initially, what we were excited about that for is, of course, the energy savings. And uh, that gets a, that's a very big deal, particularly in Europe, where uh, energy uh, ratings are put on filters as they're sold into the market, so consumers can see do they have an A plus filter or do they have a, a D filter. Uh, and that payback is pretty quick. You know, would you pay a little bit more for? Uh, a filter with a higher energy rating, you certainly would if you would get that back uh, easily within the lifetime of that filter. And that, that's a great value proposition. But what we're, we're now seeing is that people like that lower pressure drop because they can install a higher efficiency into the, uh, an air handler that maybe was initially only rated for, uh, for a lower efficiency. So with COVID and the awareness of indoor air quality, it's, it's uh, it's having a little slightly different value proposition than we initially intended. But nevertheless, energy is a, uh, it's a consideration and, and certainly the capability of the existing fan is a uh, consideration as well. So uh, if you can upgrade with an electrostatic charge filter, uh, not increasing the pressure drop, uh, you're um, not only don't increase the uh, energy, but you, uh, uh, you don't have the equipment uh, costs of uh, upgrading as well. That's right. That's right. And it also, there's another angle on there, which if you look at the, a lot of, a lot of people talk about the total cost of ownership, which I think is exactly the right thing to look at. Uh, a big piece of that is the form factor of the filter. So with NanoWave, you can have a pocket filter that can have the same kind of performance as a V-Bank. That's a big deal in terms of space that it takes up, in terms of weight, 
uh, in terms of the install and also in terms of the disposal when uh, when you have to get rid of these things. So uh, it, that's that's another angle to, to look at in this total cost of ownership. Uh, a, lot, a lot of interesting uh, thoughts here. Um, again, like to go back to kind of an overview again. You've got a new material for non-surgical gowns. You're supplying the filter media for the, the respirators, ventilators, uh, and as and um, uh, surgical hoods. And uh, so, to what extent are some of the same filter media uh, being used in a number of these applications, and are likely to be in short supply? <laughs> quite, quite a large extent. Uh, in fact, these days. Much of my time uh, is taken up trying to find solutions for that and also uh, to try to help uh, assure customers that, uh, that we can do something about that longer term. Uh, what's really been pleasing to me is that the industry overall has had quite a humanitarian response to this. Uh, people are, are well, they, they're accepting that, hey, I'm sorry, we can't supply you maybe the, the ASHRAE uh, pocket media that we used to uh, because now we want to use that melt blown to make uh, N95 face masks. So uh, that's kind of the trade-offs that were happening. Uh, the big question is, is how much longer will this demand last? And uh, like most companies, uh, we're trying to make sure we can get out as much as we can and are making plans for long term to ensure that uh, we are an active player and continue to be in these markets. And that really is a challenge, isn't it? Uh, that uh, the last thing you want to do is to build a lot of um, capability and then not have any markets for it. <laughs> that's that's right. We, uh, you know, we've had our our, uh, our experiences with that sort of thing too. Uh, you know, you can never get the timing just right. But but that that's it. So it would be helpful, of course, if uh, if you had a better line of sight. To long-term stability. Of course, the lead time to make any major capital expansion moves is quite long. So uh, I think everyone's asking themselves the same things. Um, you know, when when will this happen again? How long will this continue? Uh, all all great questions. And uh, you know, there's also this pressure to uh, to have more domestic material in any country so you can be self. So I think that you're going to see a big increase in, uh, in global capacity out of this, which will kind of shift the landscape quite a bit. And there's a lot of related questions. Uh, in fact, uh, you had a, an interview uh, here that we uh, were going to link to make sure our, our viewers uh, get it as well. Uh, it was at the Filtotech, uh, Filtech show on uh, indoor air and basically Pointing out the, but this is before COVID, uh, the advantages uh, of, uh, of indoor air uh, purity in terms of uh, health of individuals, regardless of, of COVID. And uh, so in terms of long-term uh, awareness and demand for these sorts of things, uh, uh, you can certainly speculate that people are not going to want to go back to less efficient uh, filtration uh, because of all these other uh, reasons, uh, uh, the indoor air pollutants uh, and uh, uh, are not enough justification possibly even without the COVID to remove some of these uh, uh, contaminants. And I think that was one of the things that you alluded to in that interview, was it not? Uh, absolutely. I, uh, I still really believe in that. And I think if anything, it's only uh, increased the pace of which people have become aware of that. Um, you know, you, you hear uh, people now uh, that have nothing to do with the industry. They know what a MERV-13 filter is, and they certainly know what an N95 mask is. So uh, people are aware, and uh, why would you want to have a lower efficiency filter? There's not really a, a reason why you'd want to do that. So I think it's going to be a permanent shift, and uh, it's a great opportunity for the filtration industry overall to really uh, help out uh, really mankind with, with indoor air quality and uh, better health, better life. And I think that, you know, you positioned on a worldwide basis. Would you want to comment? I mean, here you've got a, an R&D facility in Suchow. And in fact, I was over at Filtration uh, 2004. In fact, I was a keynote speaker uh, there. And uh, the uh, uh, 
uh, you know, you had a big booth. You just opened up that facility there uh, uh, in Suzhou, and uh, and uh, you know, now you're doing R and D as well as production there. Would you like to just comment on your activities in that region? Sure. We uh, yeah, we've been there for for quite a long time, um, and really see that as uh, our beachhead for the greater Asia Pacific region. We uh, we initially focused, like we have uh, with a lot of our markets, on process uh, protection. Uh, but now, uh, like we're seeing here in uh, in the West, in the U.S. and Europe, that there's a greater greater opportunity in people protection. So uh, we're also adapting our products, markets, and sales efforts to focus more and more on that. Specifically in China, most of the filtration has been for uh, industrial or commercial use. Now there's a big push that we're seeing on the, com the commercial and uh, residential front as uh, people look to uh, to make an improvement in their indoor air quality. Uh, if they're wearing face masks outside, why wouldn't you want to have uh, clean air inside when you remove the face mask? That's a that's a very good point, and it it uh, is also relevant as an earlier uh, point as to how long this market is going to last uh, in China, India. And many countries around the world, there's enough concern about the outdoor air pollution that relatively efficient masks are, are being utilized. Uh, and people like Vogue Mask, for instance, uh, have had a big have had a big market uh, at one time in uh, China with very efficient uh, N95 you know quality masks just because of the uh, of the air pollutants. And of course, you do need that kind of efficiency to make any kind of impact on those uh, uh, small aerosols. So uh, the fact that you are in China, and uh, and that's one thing that we're trying to uh, research right now. We're, uh, you know, we've been, uh, like we, we just had the uh, New York Times uh, uh, did an uh, extensive um, multi-week study. Keith Bradshaw is the uh, Shanghai bureau chief there. And we were able to provide them with some information. We got some insights from what they're doing, but they did a very detailed study. But uh, uh, you know, with Sinopec having that huge production and so forth, there, there's, uh, I think, the sense that uh, China needs to gear up and supply the average uh, individual with these high efficiency masks, not just healthcare workers. And the fact that you're positioned there in China would mean you'd be able to participate in that market, would you not? Yeah, that most most definitely. And uh, the the big question there is is how uh, how quickly do you expand? How how uh, ready is the market with the giant investment that you've seen, specifically for respirator? Uh, those those technologies can be used for some of these other applications as well. But I think there's enough room uh, for all of it because uh, the HVAC market is relatively undeveloped, uh, specifically in China and also in India, as you mentioned, and uh, there's room. There's lots of room uh, for growth. I think enough room for everybody to participate. And we did a interview with Marcus Mueller uh, of Reichelfeld uh, a few days ago as well. And uh, you know, I mentioned to him that we'd been uh, tracking the Sinopec uh, activity in uh, in China, and he said, "Yeah, even a big company like Sinopec has run into problems. They they have actually come to Reichelfeld to try to uh, solve some of them." So. And of course, a lot of the smaller suppliers of, uh, of uh, melt blowns over there have uh, had disastrous uh, uh, impact, you know, uh, results. And so, having a reliable quality uh, is paramount. And I would assume that you would be able to compete, uh, certainly in the Asian market, uh, and possibly even internally, uh, domestically in China, with with a higher quality product. Would you not? That's certainly our strategy uh, from the beginning in China. We uh, we put the best available in the time. Uh, we think that the the need for quality is as important there as it is anywhere, and uh, so far uh, that's proving to be the case. Well, it's uh, you, you people are in a very interesting position and a critical player in the uh, in the marketplace. The uh, you know we we've alluded to the fact how difficult it is to, with all these different potential market opportunities. 
uh, you might just kind of we can it might just kind of end of, uh, with a little summary as on how you're planning to cope with all the uh, variables here and and what is your path going forward. That, that's a great question. That that's the hundred billion dollar question. We uh, we we studied a lot. We uh, we like the long term prospects as we talked about for uh, the increasing efficiency that we see in HBAC and even in the in the respirator markets. Uh, for us, uh, the next the next steps of investments are uh, are going to be important. We've already uh, announced some expansion for some of our materials uh, in the UK and in the US. Uh, we're studying also what more to do uh, in those regions as well as in uh, in Asia Pacific overall. We uh, we think that these are going to be permanent shifts. We think that uh, the markets will uh, will increasingly look for efficiency, uh, even in in areas uh, like in cabin air, in automobiles, for example. Uh, face masks, we've talked about HVAC, even clean rooms uh, and liquid filtration. The world really needs uh, more clean air and more more uh, clean liquids. So we we feel that the prospects are bright. Uh, we feel we need to differentiate, and H and B is going to do that on uh, on performance. And we think if we can stick to that with consistent quality and uh, having uh, the lowest energy consumption, we can provide uh, the best value overall. Well, I, I think that's a great summary and a, probably a good way to uh, end the interview, although I, I, I'd like to talk to you on all sorts of things for an uh, extended period, but maybe we can have another one of these uh, interviews later. Yeah, and uh, Mike, I'd like to thank you for participating today, and we'll uh, we'll send you uh, a link to the uh, YouTube and, and cover it in our alert uh, tomorrow, and uh, hope to do another one in the future. Yeah, that sounds great. I appreciate that. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Ross. Okay. Thanks a lot. Bye now. Thank you. Bye-bye.